The following interview was conducted with <clears throat> Frederick Tom Sparrow, Professor Emeritus of Industrial Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, February 15, 2011 in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Good afternoon, Professor Farrow, and thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. My pleasure. Let's start off. Tell us where and when you were born and your parents and well, siblings. Well, I'm one of the few people you'll meet who was born in our nation's capital, Probably. Washington, D.C. My Lord. Um, my grandparents, my father's mother and father, both um, had lived there all their lives. And um, we were at the time, um, when my mother was pregnant, we were, dad was teaching at Dartmouth. And uh, mom was not that convinced this was a good place to have a kid. So uh, she bundled up, went on down to Washington. Where the family relatives were. That's right, right where the well relatives were. And so uh, I came into existence on December 4th, 1930, okay. which is a few years ago, before my voice gave up. <laughs> so um, I was born in Washington and uh, went back to um, Dartmouth, Hanover. Where dad was teaching, where we, uh, dad was a botanist and a very distinguished uh, academic. Um, a, uh, he had an interesting mind. He was, his mind was not analytic, but it was uh, descriptive. He was a great taxonomy guy. He loved to classify things. And at the time, this was before the, the, the genetic revolution, that's sort of what a botanist did, was classify. Sure, so anyway, he was a botanist, uh, got his PhD at Harvard. So um, he left to wear his, um, his um, scarlet coat with all the rest of the crimson, pardon me, not scarlet, crimson coat, uh, academic gown on all the professions. Anyway, um, so... What was it uh, like growing up there? Well, it was cold. Cold, yes. <laughs> it was oh, cold. yes, cold, yeah. But I learned how to ski as a little kid. And um, uh, we grew up right next to the football stadium. And um, I used to go over and watch the football team practice. And... Uh, uh, the coach took a liking to me, and the coach happened to be a guy named Earl Red Blake, who went, went on, on to Army West Point. That's exactly right. So as a kid, I sort of uh, threw the football around with uh, Red Blake, which was fun. And later on, um, I never did contact him. I wish that I would have, but he sure. was, you know, for a little kid to live next door to a, to the football coach's domain and be accepted over there. That was pretty neat. Right. So I was there for four years. Then Dad got a, uh, uh, right in the middle of the, the Depression when uh, everybody else was having trouble, we lucked out because Dad got a two-year appointment to Cambridge University in England. And it turned out that if we were depressed, England was super depressed. So the salary that uh, was transferred, we did very well in England. So um, I was lived in England for two years until 1936 when uh, we returned, um, having fond memories of a nanny. Had, even a university professor with a nanny at that time was pretty unusual, but there was one. <clears throat> and then we uh, came back to the United States and uh, began, Dad began teaching in Ann Arbor. So Ann Arbor from, is where I lived from six on until uh, I got married. Okay, so, so tell us about grade school and high school there. Yeah, I went to University Elementary School which was a progressive, Dewey-like uh, school. Never learned my multiplication tables, never learned how to spell, but learned how to think. Uh, I didn't realize that I could see the future so well with spell check. <laughs> but anyway, as a kid, um, uh, it was a free form school. The only thing weird about it was um, there were little screens uh, all around the room where people, te uh, adult teachers or teachers to me could look out. You probably remember. And peer I down about those, right? peer down and watch us uh, do our thing. So the um, elementary school was really neat. I, it was a free form. Um, that's where I learned how to love to read. I had dear Miss Davis as our uh, librarian who allowed me free reign, and I basically became a bookworm. The school was probably didn't have a lot of children in it. What, what I did. Grades it, one through eight. One or? actually went through twelve. Oh, wow. so I started out. Um, <clears throat> um, the funny part about it is, I ended up, as you know, teaching a, a sort of applied mathematics. And in the third grade, Miss Dear Miss Kirkpatrick said, um, told my parents, whatever you do, discourage him from going on to teaching math because he's no, or doing anything mathematical because he really. They used to call it dyscalculia as opposed to dyslexia. 
Anyway, um, turned out she was wrong. So from grades one to six, I said I had a free hand. Um, I was a storyteller as a kid, and um, that had interesting repercussions. I once convinced uh, our, my sixth grade teacher that I had just gotten back from a round the world trip on the China Clipper. And I remember him calling up my mother and father and saying, did Tom really go around the world in the China Clipper? And of course, uh, anyway, first day and fourth. So um, then um, I was not a very good student. In fact, I was a bad student. Uh, so from grade six, seven, eight, and nine, I said it deteriorated in terms of uh, academics. In the ninth grade, gosh, this takes me back. In the ninth grade, I was taking Latin, and um, I had, the, I wasn't a very studious person, as I said. Um, when I was um, preparing for the final exam in Latin, and uh, in freshman year. Uh, in ninth grade, oh, yeah, freshman yeah, year. Yeah. Um, my mother said, go upstairs and study for your exam because it's tomorrow. And she came upstairs and opened the door and there I was lying on a bed. And she said, well, why aren't you studying for the exam tomorrow? And I said, I can't. She said, why? Well, I said, I've been tearing the pages out of the book. <laughs> so all I had left was a book about half torn out. Anyway, <laughs> my mother said, that's the last straw. Slam, the door slammed shut. And I heard stop, 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 stop. And then mumble, 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 then stop, 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 getting louder. Okay, that's it. You're going away to school. My argument was that I was smarter than Billy Buckman, the local pig farmer's kid. And so why, why are you sending me away? There's somebody not as good as I am in the class. Anyway, I ended up going to a private school, Mercersburg, which is a very good school in Pennsylvania. I was a scholarship kid because, you know, our family didn't have much money. So I was a working boy. And uh, so I basically worked my way through Mercersburg, which had its good points and its bad points. Working boy was bad, but they gave you a wonderful, wonderful education. Sure. Was it uh, all guys? Was it co-ed? Or was it was it all guys. Basically, it was a mili military school for oh, okay. rich delinquents kids. Pardon, no. That's the wrong way to say it. Rich kids who are delinquents. There we got it. And, uh, but no uniforms. But I had everything else. But I got a wonderful education, even though I'm still mad at it, because uh, at that time, working boys were segregated. And we sort of had to get up early, lived in our own dorms. And we were almost like servants. And uh, that, What I mean, sort of things, what duties did you Wait have? tables. Okay. We were basically the waiters. Were all meals served? Were all meals served, yeah, yeah. Hmm. So um, that takes us up to the uh, 12th grade. So I came in to the University of Michigan uh, super well educated. Uh, I'd always been tested out better than my brain really showed, so it was nice to have that muscle strengthened by a place like Mercersburg. So that takes us up to grade 12. Shall I go on? Right. Now then going to college, yeah. you decided to go to meet your father was in Michigan? Yeah, dad okay. was, a, actually both, both of them were. My okay. mother was, a, right after the war there was a shortage of English teachers and mom had been trained as an English teacher and a language teacher. So she taught for four years right at Michigan right after the war and my dad uh, was there for the whole time. Sure, okay. So um, ended up um, going to Michigan and uh, living at home which had its advantages, because everybody else couldn't drive a car, but I could drive a car, as long as I kept the loaf of bread in the back. The reason was, if you were stopped, you had to have a reason for why you were driving. Oh, the reason I'm driving is I am picking up a loaf of bread for the family. You can see it in the back seat. Well, if they would have picked it up and bounced it, they would have realized <laughs> how stale it was. Um, so I went to Michigan, pledged a fraternity, uh, got caught in a whole bunch of stuff that uh, we stuffed the ballot box so I could get out of the student council, which wasn't the wisest thing we've ever done. Um, the, um, I started out as a um, liberal arts major, but then got interested in geology. So the undergraduate years from years one, two, and three were sort of dominated by two things, geology and number two, I sang in the Glee Club. It doesn't sound that way, 
because my voice is shot, literally. But I, that was a wonderful experience. You know, remember Bob in uh, Sesame Street? Anyway, he was our he was the tenor soloist. Oh my gosh! <laughs> uh, we had a wonderful week. Uh, then it um, after I got out of Mercersburg, I volunteered for the uh, Marine Corps Officers Training School, uh, which was sort of like ROTC. You didn't have to go in right away, uh, so you could sort of spend time. Uh, the uh, reason was my uncle was a big deal Marine, and he sort of encouraged me. So I ended up uh, r enrolling in platoon leader's class, which meant summers I spent some time uh, being a toy Marine. Well, you know what happened in 1951? The Korean War, as you know, what Jim tell you. Anyway, um, I got called up. And, um, and you were in college. At of college, as a junior, yeah, yeah, as a junior. So I got called up, and I went into the uh, the, the um, uh, depot in, in Detroit, and um, I took the physical exam. And the um, the physician, when we got all through, said, "I got some good news and bad news." Um, the uh, good news, if you think of it, is that you flunked the uh, the eyes examination for officers training, so you're not going to be an officer. The bad news is you passed the enlisted man. <laughs> exam. So um, I ended up being a private in the Marine Corps and going to Paris Island and uh, uh, spending um, a year, over a year and a half on active duty in the Marine Corps. Um, never went overseas. The reason was uh, our platoon at Paris Island was the last platoon through Paris Island before the draftees came. That's something you don't hear much about. But the Marine Corps actually had to draft people to, to get in to fill their slots during the Korean War. But our platoon was one of the last ones that, that went through that it was all volunteers. So they slay, saved all the good spots for us. And one of the spots uh, was the one I got, which was to train people, uh, to learn how to train people to repair a field um, uh, artillery sets, uh, spotting uh, mechanisms and uh, 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 I'm having a senior moment. Anyway, uh, intercoms, walkie-talkies. There right. we are. That's what we call them then. So I spent the entire time uh, first learning how to repair them, then learning how to teach how to, how to repair them, and then teaching others how to repair them. So I fought the Battle of Great Lakes. I fought the training center, the Battle of uh, San Diego, the Battle of um, Pendleton, and the Battle of Treasure Island. <laughs> and never got out of the United States. So then I um, um, graduated. I you went back to Michigan to finish? Went back point. to Michigan, finished. By that time, I was pretty tired of living in a tent. And I didn't, I suddenly realized that I, if I were going to continue to be a geologist, I would uh, be right back in the tent. So I decided as a senior to get my degree, but that was it. And then I um, got married. And uh, went to Cornell to get an MBA. Um, I wanted to get into Harvard Business School, but I never made the cut, even though there were a few strings that were pulled because Dad was a Harvard graduate, didn't do any good. So I got a second prize, which was Cornell, and I was there for two years. It was a very interesting time for me because mm -hmm. at that time I, I had the usual advantage you have over MBAs who – that a scientist has over MBAs. I was, and that was when quantitative techniques were just beginning to get introduced into a business school. So I had a big advantage at, at Cornell. Because you had a background. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I graduated uh, as class marshal and all the good stuff. My career choice at that time, I had a fork in the road. I, my um, mother's family, my father, my grandfather was um, a, treasurer of Imperial Oil Company, which was the big, uh, which the was... The British company. Yeah, right? it was the Canadian equivalent of Standard Oil. It was called Imperial Oil. And um, so a guy named Harry McCobb at that time was president of, uh, of Standard Oil, and he wanted me to come to work for, for that company. Um, but my wife took one look at the little guidebook that each person was asked to review to see whether they really wanted to go to work uh, under the circumstances that were offered. 
the circumstances that were offered as I would have gone to Indonesia and spent, um, and she would have spent the entire time supervising the gardener, the butler, the, <laughs> the, the two cooks, the and help. the 20-some place settings of, uh, of uh, China, which she was uh, to be given. And that wasn't quite what, my, what Linda uh, thought that was going to be what she wanted to do, spend her life entertaining. So, so the other job I was offered as a result of a, a thesis I wrote uh, was with the Atomic Energy Commission in 1956. And so I decided to go to work for the AEC, which was a um, wonderful experience. Were we in Washington? Today? Washington, D.C. Okay. We were downtown on Constitution Avenue at the time. Then, because Strauss, Admiral Strauss, who was the head of the chairman of AEC, uh, said we really need to decentralize Washington, D.C. because of atomic bomb attacks. So naturally, the first agency that left was AEC. So we went out to Germantown, Maryland. And we were there for, I had that job for three years, which was a wonderful job, way over my head. The guys, I didn't know it at the time, but I worked for a guy named John von Neumann, who um, invented game theory along with Morgenstern. So um, I thought, I didn't know who these guys were. And I was in with a bunch of super geniuses. And I kept thinking, what am I doing here? But I, anyway, I stuck it out. We lived on the estate uh, of uh, a guy named General Wedemeyer, who uh, during the World Chinese- War, World War II. No, uh, World War II, yeah. Right. He, was, he wrote uh, the Wedemeyer Report. He was very much in the camp of Chiang Kai-shek. He was in the Pacific. Yeah, in the Pacific. Right. So we lived in his estate and uh, got to know all these arch-conservative people, including I've been swimming with William Buckley, <laughs> of all things. Had a big swimming pool out back, and, we, and um, they used to invite us to the parties. So we used to go over there, and I met all these, what turned out, uh, Pat Buchanan, uh, Buckley, all these arch-conservatives uh, later on who I didn't have much respect for, except Buckley, um, were sort of our friends. So um, we had no idea what was going on. We, if, anyway, so um, after that, uh, let's see what happened. I worked for them for three years. Then I decided I got to get a, a better education. It's pretty clear that if these, this is the competition I'm going to be up against in life, I better do something more. Sure. All right. So I went back to uh, Michigan on a Ford uh, scholarship, Ford, uh, Ford Foundation scholarship. Got my Ph.D. in 1962, 1963. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, uh, my thesis advisors were a guy named Kenneth Boulding, who uh, you probably heard about, the guy who invented the spaceship Earth and a few other things. Just a one, no Ph.D., smartest man I've ever met in my life. He was uh, on my committee. Merrill Flood, who went on to become a star in uh, operations research, um, uh, Peter Newman, who was an economist. I got a joint PhD in economics and operations research. So half my committee was economists, half were uh, um, uh, industrial engineers. So um, the other guy on my committee was a guy named Dick Evans, whose father just happened to be dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Johns Hopkins. And that plus the fact that Peter Newman uh, uh, had gone there the year before I completed my thesis, even though we stayed in the committee, meant that I got an offer from Johns Hopkins. So um, I went to Johns Hopkins in the summer of 63 and um, stayed there until 1973. I was there for 10 years. Okay. It was a wonderful introduction to how a really good department operates. Do, uh, did you have children by that time? Yes. No. Two kids. Okay. Uh, uh, my oldest, Fred, who's now a, uh, of all things, a conservative uh, commentator, radio commentator um, in uh, the Lansing, Michigan area, and a son who uh, has every kid's dream job. He publishes drag racing magazines and also runs drag races. Uh, as a So one kid's a a, a radio personality, as they say, and the other is a publisher of, um, of uh, uh, racing magazines. 
Um, my wife, first wife, was a childhood sweetheart. And one of those stories where um, we started out uh, together and we grew apart. So in 1973, I got a divorce and um, uh, decided to leave Hopkins. I didn't have to because I had tenure and all the rest of it, but it wasn't a healthy thing for me to try and keep the marriage together. So uh, I moved to Washington, D.C. and took a job with the National Science Foundation. And at that time, the, uh, the NSF was just starting something called RAN, Research Applied to National Needs, which um, I still think was a good idea. Rather than have the research uh, directions dictated by the researchers, what they did is take a look at national problems and say, okay, what can research do in the area of, say, fire protection? or ambulance, or streets, or things like that. Uh, the big thing that when I took the job was energy, because in uh, 1973 there were just the beginnings of the rumblings of the, right. of the discontent. And uh, all the Arabs' sons who had all gone to business school realized if we, re if we cut back on output, I bet we can increase price. And so they were, it was just at the beginning when, en when uh, energy was um, becoming a major issue. And I had written in the energy factory. Most of my earlier articles were in energy. So I ended up running the engineering energy program for research applied to national needs. Was there until 1976. Um, That's a good opportunity for you. Oh my gosh, it yeah. was one of those lucky the things. Early days, you know. So it was yeah. fun. Um, 1976, I made a big career mistake. I. I decided to open myself up to the highest bidder in terms of bucks. And I said, at the time, I had a really responsible job. I had a flag and a blue rug and a presidential appointment, and I was 40, 46 years old. So, I, you know, pretty much stuff. Well, so it turned out the university that um, bid highest for my services, or put it another way, the one that most overestimated my benefit. <laughs> <laughs> The winner's curse, that's what we call it. Uh. Um, paid me an obscene amount of money to come to the University of Houston. They head up um, the industrial engineering department. Uh, it was still as a joint appointment in economics. So I went down there, and um, it was a disaster. I'll give you an idea of how bad the place was. Um, it had been founded in 1932. In 1977, uh, they decided we're going to retroactively change the date of the founding from 1932 to 1927 uh, so we could have our, our 50th anniversary. Plus, we could declare a guy named E. Roy Cullen to be a graduate because the faint thread of the argument that allowed them to say we started in 27 was the night school that preceded the University of Houston. It was private at the time. I started in 1927, and in that class was E. Roy Cullen. So um, it was a bunch of us got together and, and determined that 50 years prior to 1927, the building had been built in which the night school was founded. So we had this good idea, let's declare our university 100 years old, because after all, the building that had been built, <laughs> that had, was built uh, to house the night school, was 100 years old, and so why not declare it? Uh, the guys didn't think I was very funny, but we thought it was hilarious. So now what? Well, anyway, uh, thank God, Wilbur Meyer, whom you know, and Gene Goodson, whom you ought to interview, incidentally, um, was the, um, they rescued me from um, University of Houston. And in 1978, I arrived here with a, with a very happy, excuse me. Yeah, sure. Now at Purdue. Okay. Yeah. So um, in February. Did you come for an interview or how did oh, you? Oh, I did. That's a funny story. Oh. I came in February 78 for an interview. Oh. Do you remember fe February? Remember the snow? Remember the guys that froze to death on the way uh, to Chicago? I drove down and, man, I saw. Did you drive from Houston? Uh, no, I drove from Chicago, which was in some ways worse yet. Because that was that that storm right in the middle. Did you of must it. have gotten in just be before the thing started. Just after. Oh, after. So they had plowed the road, and that was about it. Um, so 
I got here, and Wilmer and uh, Gene met me uh, at the union and said, let's go out, to, I'll take you out to dinner. So we went out to, um, what's the place that first was hit by the tornado and then burned oh, down? Oh, out there at uh, uh, 52. West Oaks. Uh, I can't think of the name I of the know place. The one anyway, there. that place, Place X. And uh, we got all through dinner, and uh, Gene looked at uh, Wilbur and said, well, why don't you pay for it because I didn't bring my credit card. And Wilbur said, oh, my God, I didn't bring mine either. So guess who ended up paying for it? Who had the credit Me. card? I had the credit card. Yeah. So I got to buy myself my own lunch. Anyway, I was really indebted to, to them. Um, so my advice to all aspiring young professors is never sell your soul to the highest bidder. <laughs> and it hadn't been for Wilbur and uh, uh, Gene. When I came here, I uh, interesting, I was one of the few professors, full professors, who Did was hired. as a full prof? Yeah. With tenure and everything? No, not with tenure. That's the interesting part. Wilbur said, uh, it turns out tenure is awarded by the department. And you don't have to go through it. I don't know whether it's true anymore or not. But at the time, the department could, uh, could uh, give tenure. So um, Wilbur said, look, the only thing we're worried about is whether you're really an engineer or not. Because I insisted upon a joint appointment, as I'd had, both at uh, Houston and at uh, Johns, Hopkins. Johns Hopkins, both in economics and in, uh, in engineering. And I said, he said, to tell you what, why don't you just agree to publish four articles? In IE, when you publish four, we'll give you tenure, which is what happened. Well, as soon as I got tenure, uh, and was sort of my, this is where I wanted to stay, Gene announced that he was taken off to become president of uh, the company that makes Hummers. I forget what the name of it is. Anyway, he left uh, 1982, at which time I became head of the Institute for Interdisciplinary Engineering Studies. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. it's... Um, it's and uh, he headed that? He started it. Oh, he, he was started. the founding guy. And um, at the time, it was a place where uh, professors who had got tired of having to to listen to their chairman and who were independent financing could take their research uh, organizations and house them, which meant none of the chairmen were particularly, uh, I was not their favorite person because what my organization did was give them a chance, their stars who were independently wealthy because of research, uh, a chance to, uh, to have another home. So I basically inherited all the, uh, the malcontents <laughs> who, um, couldn't get along with their chairman, yet had major research programs, which, uh, that which was like a it, well, it was it was interesting. Now that it wasn't the only people. We all, we had uh, the beginning of uh, George Siles' operation, which is the laboratory renewable uh, resource engineering. Larry, uh, we had Sindus, which was the uh, uh, Talukian Center for uh, Numerical Data Analysis. Oh, sorry, and, uh, yeah, the one they just torn down, yeah. tore down. Um, we had a coal center. Um, we had... Um, so a lot of centers, more of it. Yeah, it was all area. centers, right. yeah. Okay. Uh, Ted Williams' uh, uh, industrial applications of, uh, of automatic control lab. Uh, and um, I'm missing something. Oh, yeah, the CAD CAM lab uh, that came out of ME. Uh, so... Uh, the big fish that we landed was Les Geddes, uh, who came up, brought his operation up from Texas. From so the, from the, the, the Hill and Brandt Biomedical Engineering Program was also in the center. So it was a, for 18 years, I sort of made sure that the doors were open and the lights on and the toilets worked. And right. well, were you still with IE too? Uh, still with IE. Oh, okay. When I came here, the deal was that uh, we're going to appoint you full-time IE until you uh, get your get your tenure, and then you're going to go over and work with with Gene as associate director of the institute. Well, I didn't know at the time, but uh, it's clear that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Gene was going to leave, so so for the last, so for the 18 years I held a joint appointment. Uh, half my time spent in the department, the other half uh, as director of the institute. And it was the, uh, truthfully, it was the money cow at the time for the schools of engineering. It was, um, it was an interesting job. I'm not much of an administrator. I, I'm more of a doer. But the, the, that's the wrong way to say it, because administrators do. But I was more of an academic than sure. an administrator. 
1990, I picked up another center, uh, State Utility Forecasting. Yeah, that, that's some, yeah. Which uh, turned out to be a wonderful uh, stroke of luck. Otto Doring had started it, and Otto had done it as a service to the university to start a center that was devoted to being the technical staff for the, our Indiana Regulatory Commission, which is really what Sufi. That's the liaison with you. They're the liaison with that. That's right. State our state. money comes from them. Okay. It still does. Okay. So we were we were the technical advisors to the State Utility Commission, which was just a wonderful thing for me, because I was sort of tired of writing funny articles for people that didn't read them, and so it was good for me to be in the middle of a policy, an engineering and public policy uh, operation that really was the gold standard for a long time for uh, applied engineering help at the state level. It was before TAP really got off the ground. So, um, Was the composition primarily Purdue? Was it they, they sort of were in charge of it? Or what was the administrator? How was that structured? Uh, the state... The state, I, the, I was the director, but okay. we had, okay. we also had guys from um, IU. All right. Um, in fact, yeah, uh, one of my old graduate students, of all things, Bruce Chaffee, uh, what was the the most qualified guy at IU, and he became the lead point for the uh, the IU portion. Basically, what IU did was they forecast gross state product, and we forecast kilowatt hours per unit of gross state product. You multiply the two numbers together and you get kilowatt hours sure. as a forecast. Sure. Okay. So our job was to uh, forecast electricity demand in the state. And we'd put together, auto would put together a really first rate model that um, if the data were there, uh, would have been wonderful. But the problem always was um, the data just weren't there to support most of the modeling that we did. So in my era, we s made the model simpler to reflect the, the scarcity of data. You can build the world's most wonderful model, but if you can't populate it with data, what's the sense? So um, again, it was sort of a good luck for, for me, just as I hit the NSF at the time of energy, I hit the regulatory business at the time of deregulation of the electricity industry. Mm -hmm. So among the things that I'm most proud of was the fact that we came out at a at a time when everybody else was saying deregulation is the key to uh, decrease costs. We came out with a study that said if you deregulate Indiana, you're going to increase electricity prices, not decrease. Now that raised a lot of eyebrows, as you can imagine. How is it possible? Well, it turns out that under regulation, the way we were, we have, it's, well, I'll begin with preface, we have the lowest, next to Kentucky, we have the lowest cost of electricity generate in the country. Under regulation, which minimizes the amount of trade that can take place between states, our surrounding states, Michigan, Illinois, Ohio, all of which were high-cost high states, uh, looked across borders and said, gee, I wish I had some of that electricity because it's so cheap. With deregulation, free trade comes. So what was, what was going to happen? Illinois was going to start bidding for our electricity, Michigan and Ohio. What would happen to our rates? They'd go up. So, because of the study was so well accepted, and I'm, well done at the same and time, and well done, sure. yeah, I'd like to think that uh, that we played a role in preventing Indiana from following what everybody else was doing, right. Right. which is deregulation, and we're still regulated, and we benefit enormously from right. it. Right. Yeah. The other thing, what about that Center for Coal Technology? Research? That started as a, almost like an afterthought. Oh. Uh, there's something called um, uh, the Indiana, oh, anyway, it's the Coal Lobbying Group. Well, the legislature uh, created that in 02. That's right. Yeah, it was the law put together by Nat Noland, who is the head of the uh, Indiana Coal Council. There we are. I remember the name now. Mm -hmm. He wanted it uh, because coal was had a bad enough name then, much less now. So they fund, it was one of those unfunded mandates. Let's create it. And uh, then we'll figure out a way of funding it later on. So they're looking around for a director, and they figured, well, let's have Tom. He's, he knows a lot of energy stuff. So they made me the founding director of the center. 
Um, and along with it came, after a little shaking of the trees, came $4 million uh, funding uh, from uh, 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 the utilities that really wanted to maintain coal as a viable fuel. And this was when the CO2 noise was really beginning to rumble. heat up. And rumble, that's right. So um, I ran that for four years and turned it over just three years ago to uh, a state employee since it's the Indiana uh, Center for Coal Technology Research, not the Purdue Center. So we, we decided uh, uh, Marty Irwin, who worked for the governor, uh, took it over and has been running it ever since. Was it's, it ever housed here? Or was yeah, it, oh, it was, was housed it? here. It's oh. still housed here. Is it? Okay. Fact, yeah. Discovery yeah, Park? Yeah, Discovery Park, okay. yeah. Okay, okay. So its uh, its goal is to uh, try and push uh, technology developments that can make coal competitive. So right now it's uh, something called the Integrated Gasification uh, Combined Cycle Plant, which gasifies coal first and then burns it. Why? With, if you gasify, you can get the CO2 out very easily. Doesn't mean you can store it easily, but you can at least get it out. It doesn't cost you a fortune to get it out. Okay. Now the next thing, of course, was that uh, your energy center, and you've been involved with that out there. The right. Energy center. Yes. Yeah. Right. Are, you, are you still involved with that? Uh, yeah, I'm a consultant. The fact okay. is, that's what I was doing this morning. I was okay. trying to figure out how to write up some stuff. Yeah. Uh, Jay Gore uh, was the first director, okay. and uh, good old Jay. Um, we had, uh, better not. Um, you Jay, were the executive for coal research, and then. Now, the Coal Transformation Laboratory? That's true, but that was a paper organization. Okay, okay. That was there just so we could have a Purdue activity okay. at Purdue aimed at coal. Okay. But in fact, it was uh, always a, a, a paper organization. Okay. 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 What, is, what are you doing? What is, what, for the researchers, what was the Energy Center's focus? What was? And it's out there in Discovery Park. These Correct. Yeah, it actually it was an umbrella. It wasn't much different than the energy center we had at the Interdisciplinary Engineering Center. Okay. It was a, a lot of a lot of stuff was going on. At one time, Bob Greenor, Greencorn and I ran a survey, and there was something like I think ninety million, maybe it was anyway. There was a huge amount of research going on at Purdue that could be called energy research. Scattered all. Scattered around. around. So the idea was to bring them all together. Uh, the Energy Center doesn't have any particular bias towards one type of research or another. Uh, there's behavioral research, there's a hard engineering research. The combustion lab is sort of where it's because of, of Jay's uh, connection with the combustion lab. A lot of the work was um, has to do with the science of combustion. Mm -hmm. So the purpose was to um, sort of encourage energy research. One of the big tragedies was I was never able to get a group within IE. Uh, interested. Um, it was really unfortunate. There weren't any people within IE that really wanted to do energy research. There, there are now. But at the time, there really weren't. Dennis Engi, who you remember, um, was brought in with the hopes of him sort of putting together uh, an energy research group within IE, but it never happened. Okay. okay. Um, what is your affiliation? Uh, during the time you've been here, there was been some affiliation with the Cranard. I had a I okay. had an appointment when okay. I came here. Is that a cur like a courtesy appointment? Or it was no, I had oh. tenure over there. Okay, but I never exercised it. Okay, uh, as time went on, it became clear that uh, that I was a fish out of water over there. I was better off uh, uh, teaching economics to engineers than out of IE. the other way, yeah, out of IE, okay. and uh, teaching uh, engineering to economists. Yeah. One thing I was going to ask you, the AT&T summer program, you were involved mm -hmm. in that. Sure was. Time, right. That was yeah. Oh, it was a, oh, my gosh. Jim won the hearts and minds of all of us. He ran that thing. Um, it was a wonderful program. Yeah, it was good. It was good. Yeah. Right. And we ended, I ended up teaching a course in um, basically microeconomics for engineers. Sure. Okay. Uh, synergistic activities. What, what about the rebuilding of the higher education in Afghanistan? Uh, and that, also some of your power projects that you were Yeah, doing. yeah, okay, Afghanistan. All that started with a guy named Zarjan Baha. Have you interviewed him yet? In technology. Yeah, wonderful guy. Yes. 
um, I sort of got interested. Um, I was getting bored, <laughs> and I wanted to do something interesting. The university has had a long-standing connection with Kabul University. Um, the king of Afghanistan visited here. You bet he did. Right. That's oh, yeah. exactly right. He got an honorary here. degree. Oh, yeah. Um, so um, we had this natural connection, and Dr. Jishki was interested at the time instead of fostering our connection. So um, I got together with Zarjan, who I'd known for a bunch of years, and we decided the best thing we could do would be to start a program to help rebuild the engineering school. Um, uh, since ag was well taken care of by Kevin McNamara, uh, Kevin's program with, with uh, agriculture is the one thing that's kept going. So we got together a, a bunch of people, sent them over there. They did an assessment, a need, needs assessment for the university, came back with a laundry list of things that needed to be done, and uh, we did them. Um, most of all, it had to do with bringing them into the, uh, the 19th century. The, uh, at the time, the engineering curriculum was dominated by Muslim-oriented, mu Muslim engineering. What, what? I, mean, I, I understand pray, prayer is nice, but you don't pray to build a bridge. So um, we got him a bunch of computers, and um, uh, it was one of the more rewarding things I've done. Uh, we didn't get much support from um, the uh, engineering administration. Uh, Linda Katei at the time was not very supportive of sending our professors over to Kabul at the time. So, What's uh, the status of that now? Uh, yeah. Well, the, the part that's con going like gangbusters is the ag part. Ag part okay. And the ag engineering has continued to work, but there, I know of no contact uh, with the engineering school now, which is too bad, because yeah. that was a wonderful program. Are they still teaching it over there? Yeah. There's some engineering? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Basha was in engineering over there. He was. He was right. dean of the School dean. of Engineering. That's right. And, in fact, escaped with his life in 1978 when the Russians came. That's right. Exactly. So, um, wonderful man. A yeah. sweet, gentle. Very nice. Um, the power, some of your projects in. Yeah. The, uh, in 1995. Um, a graduate student came to Purdue for an IE named Brian Bowen, who'd uh, spent, uh, a Brit, who'd spent uh, a good about half of his life in Africa teaching uh, engineering to uh, people in um, Sierra Leone, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, uh, anyway, all the spots that were trouble spots. And he came back, and we were trying to put together a project that sort of built on his experience in Africa. In my experience in electric, electric systems. Yeah, stay yeah. closer. Okay. okay. So um, the project we started with was to try and put together a power pool for uh, South Africa. Now, during apartheid, uh, nobody traded with South Africa, uh, and all the electric transmission lines that connected South Africa with uh, uh, with all the neighboring countries had been blown up and destroyed. But the idea was there, that the willingness of the electrical engineers to work together to build a, a system so that electricity could be exchanged between countries. Now, why would that be? Well, why would it be beneficial? In the South, all they had was coal. In the North, they had lots of hydro. And it turns out for a bunch of reasons. If you combine a hydro system with a thermal system, what you basically are doing is hydro is a way of storing electricity. Normally you can't store electricity, but you can. So what it amounts to is if you tie in a hydro system a with a thermal system. system, you can smooth the load. You don't have to build a whole bunch of peaking plants because you simply store the electricity. You don't use the electricity in the, in the reservoirs. So we helped form the South African Power Pool, number one. And then we, then we were asked to help the West African Power Pool form, which was basically from Nigeria east all the way over to Senegal, all those countries, Benin, Ghana, right. Ivory Coast, all Guinea, Togo, all those countries. Uh, we helped them patch together their uh, what's, electric what's systems. They and they also had hydro in the, in the east and thermal in the west. So again, a match. We're, I'm still at it. Matter of fact, in November, December, 
I went over with uh, Paul Preckle, who took over the, a couple of my projects, to Kosovo. And we were there helping them put together a power pool, which was an experience. I bet. <laughs> um, any awards and honors that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, all my graduate students. That's good. That's nice. Uh, that was the part that I'm most proud of. I, I turned out a lot of graduate students. And they're sort of my... keep in touch? They do. Good. They do, which is nice. Every Christmas they get little Christmas cards. Right. Yeah. So uh, it's a wonderful thing to have your graduate students uh, mostly... I trained in conjunction with the State Utility Forecasting Group. So most of them are energy-oriented guys. Right. Okay. So I think of, uh, of all the things that, that uh, I left... Uh, the graduate students are the ones that made the biggest impression on me. Very good. Now, family, you have, a, um, do we have mention the children, you have another uh, wife and you live here. Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, your favorite Purdue tradition, do you have one? Well, actually, I sort of enjoy Saturdays before the football game, going down and watching the uh, football team come down the stairs. Do you ever do that? Yes. I, I think that's sort of neat. Yes. Well, you're right. Um, outstanding event? You can have more than one. Outstanding event? I have trouble with names. <laughs> and the outstanding event in my mind was when I was at, at, when I was at Cornell, uh, when I was told that I was the outstanding this and that. I, I sort of led the class through the faculty. And for reasons that are never clear to me, I remembered all their names. <laughs> That's the most, one of the more memorable <laughs> Sounds ones. good. Uh, retirement activities. What, uh, uh, still consult. Okay. Uh, mostly in uh, hydro thermal systems. Um, the, uh, that's what I've been doing, working for the Energy Center. Uh, building model airplanes, which is something I did as a kid. And I find I cannot do as well as I did when I was a kid. So, I'm, something with my hands. They've gotten fat all of a sudden. <laughs> And disposing of my mineral collection. Your what? Oh, my mineral collection. Which is quite extensive. It's uh, quite extensive. And how are you disposing I'm it? I'm giving it to the state uh, museum. It's sort of, I, it's been a fun thing to do. Every year they have a geofest. And every year uh, I sell my minerals there and give the proceeds to the uh, state museum after they have cream skinned what I offer for sale. So what I do is I lay the stuff out, price it, lay the stuff out. Then um, uh, uh, Peggy, a uh, fisher killer, comes by, says, I want that, 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 and that. And I sell the rest and give the proceeds. Oh. And it's really been fun. That is nice, yeah. How about if you industrial engineering in the 21st century, academe and profession? A couple comments. Well, I set up a scholarship for kids that were going to have a, ma a minor in economics. And I guess... I would like to see the profession embrace more engineering economics, which makes sense because that's what I am. But I really do think that's one part that's lacking in engineering education. It's made up frequently by people going out of business school uh, and getting their master's after their undergraduate. But it, yeah. it always seemed to me that one of the opportunities that IE has is to play a bigger role, and Ferd thought so too, play a bigger role in the training of, of, of the bottom line for engineers. Right now, uh, I think chemical engineering students are required to take our courses. Uh, civil engineering has their own um, um, engineering economics course, and all the rest just sort of don't do it. Sure. What I'd like to see is Purdue in particular, because with Ferd, that was one of the things we did well. Uh, have industrial engineering take a bigger leadership role in teaching uh, economics to engineers. Yeah, and good. not the traditional engineering economics, which is a thousand different ways of calculating a present value. That's not what I mean. Right. What I mean is looking at a good example. The hardest thing for an engineer to understand is the difference between price and cost. There. Engineers are automatically cost plus pricers. They don't understand. Wait a minute. If I'm the only guy who's producing a widget, maybe I can get more. 
than simply what it costs. So the whole idea of st strategy, market structure, is something engineers are going to encounter. So why not give them a little dose of it uh, as undergraduates? Right, okay. In closing, is there anything I forgot to ask or anything you want to add? I'm sure there is, but who knows? Oh. Oh, who knows? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sparrow. I really